Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of Introducing. And today I am very excited because we have Jason Moy here. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the beautiful harpsichord. Of course, uh, it's a keyboard instrument, which I do not play. <laughs> and so I've decided to bring in Jason Moy to be our expert guest to teach us all about this fascinating uh, and beautiful instrument. Jason, hey. Brandon, thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, inviting me to talk about one of my favorite instruments. Very happy to do it. Jason and I have played concerts together for a number of years, uh, and I've always, have, I've always had questions that I want to ask him that there's never time to pick his brain. I know, we're always like <laughs> running from one thing to another, tuning, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, this is great to have an afternoon to chat like this. Totally. And of course, Jason's a Theorbo enthusiast as well, <laughs> <laughs> and does actually own a Theorbo, at least for now. <laughs> yes, yes. And I have uh, a Baroque triple harp on the way. So I think it's safe to say that um, I'm a big fan of plucked string instruments, and I so admire what you do, Brandon, the fact that oh, you thanks. can pick up any plucked instrument. And I mean, there's probably nothing stopping you from playing harpsichord. You just need one. <laughs> well, don't tempt me. <laughs> How does one transition to become a harpsichord player? Like if I if I was a good pianist and sat down with the harpsichord, could I instantly play well? Or would I be like, what is this? I think for a pianist to come, uh, the first exposure to the harpsichord for so many pianists uh, is, um, I think, unnecessarily traumatic because you realize right off the bat that all of the pianistic instincts that you kind of subconsciously rely on, um, they not only uh, do nothing for you expressively, but they actively work against you on the oh. instrument. So uh, to really create resonance on the harpsichord uh, and to, to create a beautiful tone, um, your I mean, as a plucked string instrument, it's so much more uh, uh, closely related to lutes, guitars, and harps hmm. than uh, piano, which is, uh, you know, in some most way, it's a percussion instrument. Right. Um, so the playing techniques are, are entirely different. And um, granted, it has keys uh, on this instrument. Um, the keyboards are reversed as uh, they are on so many um, historical harpsichords. So the white keys are black and the black right. keys, the sharps and flats are white. Um, the harpsichord um, plucks the strings using a very small uh, pluck drum. Um, kind of like a, you know, a, a small wedge-shaped guitar pick, if you will. Um, and they uh, ride on the end of the keys on mechanisms called jacks. Mm. Um, so by depressing a key, the jack on the end comes up and the plectrum plucks the string. And there's a very ingenious but simple um, spring that allows it to sort of bounce back on the way down and gravity pull to jack back as you release the key um, so it doesn't get hung up or plucked twice mm. um, and a felt damper stops the sound of the of the string um, when the jack falls back into place okay so it's mainly the the mechanism of producing sound is different one's percussion with the hammers of a piano and one's a plucking right. mechanism which is why you're so welcome on this very plucky channel <laughs> <laughs> yes yes indeed mm -hmm. Are there any tricks given the intricacies and idioms of the harpsichord that are just really kind of fun and cool that you couldn't get, for example, on uh, a piano? Well, I think having on a large uh, double manual harpsichord like this, mm -hmm. uh, you have the two keyboards that can operate independently. Yeah. Um, in fact, there are certain pieces of music like Bach's Goldberg variations, which I have right here, um, which are specifically intended for a double manual harpsichord like this and it's mm. because there are certain passages and i'll demonstrate a little bit from the 25th variation uh, from the goldbergs where um, you have the hands crossing over um, certainly pianists do this you know all the time today right. but um, you know mechanically on the harpsichord he was intending for to allow for this. So I'll just demonstrate a little passage from that. Yeah, please do.
That's so cool. So right, you have this sort of crossover where, um, you know, there you could hear in one particular passage uh, at the end of the variation there. But then you have whole pieces by composers like Francois Couperin, for example, uh, uh, designed to take advantage of this fact that you have the two independent keyboards. There's a piece called Le Tic Toc Choc, uh, oh, yeah. or the uh, musical representation of a, a clock, uh, where the notes are, your hands are entirely just playing exactly the same notes on the top and the bottom oh. um, to sort of create this, uh, this mechanical uh, effect. I love it. I've always heard that piece. I never knew they did that. Mm-hmm. Yep. What about the strings? I've always wondered, there was a time when I was just getting into lutes and things when I thought, okay, so basically everything pre, uh, I don't know, 19th century or something like that was gut strung. <laughs> and then I later on found out that actually gut strings were played well into the 20th uh, century on most mm -hmm. guitars. And I kind of thought that for a while that in general, older strings were always gut. But then I think I asked you on a concert once, uh, harpsichords didn't historically use gut strings, did they? No, I mean, and there are gut strung harpsichords. They mm. were called, um, you know, uh, Lautenberg. Right, Bach's. Right. Uh, so Bach is a, a, was a major sort of um, proponent, um, possibly even uh, had his hand in helping to invent an instrument like that. Wow. Um, so the gut strung harpsichord certainly um, gets a lot closer to the sound world of the lute. Um, but I think at the same time, so the harpsichord itself as an instrument certainly would not have been this big the farther back you go. Uh, what we're looking at today is um, a representative of the harpsichord at its apex, mm. sort of middle of the 18th century uh, French style instrument. But the harpsichord was first um, recorded in uh, literature, I think at the end of the 1300s. Um, really? And then we see in, I think there's a sculpture and an altarpiece uh, somewhere in Germany from the early 1400s. There's like a angel or choir boy playing uh, a wing-shaped instrument, um, much smaller. So they would have been even small enough to, to fit on your lap. Um, and they had, um, they were very, they had much in common with psalteries and other instruments like that, mm. which were metal strung, wire strung. Um, psalteries, of course, played or plucked with the fingers, um, but then someone had the leap uh, to install a keyboard mechanism um, to create an, the instrument that we know of as the harpsichord today. Okay, so there are some gut strung uh, harpsichords, namely the Lautenwerk, the mm -hmm. lute harpsichord that Bach used but usually they are metal strung. Yes, yeah, they would have been wire strung. Um, I think that's the, one of the defining characteristics, let's say, of mm. uh, harpsichord type instruments. Um, you know, whatever their size, shape, or orientation of the strings, they were always uh, metal strings. So on an instrument like this, uh, we see uh, across the treble, it's um, all iron strings. Mm down to just about the tenor register when oh, it yeah. crosses over to uh, two different colors of brass. So yellow brass and red brass, which give right. the bass notes a uh, bigger bloom, uh, a, a little bit uh, bigger warmth. And the second manual, if I can open this up to show us, uh, on this instrument there are three rows of jacks and three sets of strings okay. that play the same pitches. Um, the third set of strings is actually half the length of the other two, mm. and that allows us to play the octave. So I can, uh, by activating all of the stops, by pressing one key on the bottom keyboard, you play three strings. The octave. That's all in one key. That's one key. Oh, incredible. So it is, I think, an uh, analogous to, say, a um, Baroque guitar, for example, which has yeah. multiple strings uh, per course. Right. Um, and of course, you know, when played 
at speed, it creates one sound as opposed to three different sounds. Yeah, of course. Um, and by taking, you know, the, the different uh, registers off, this would be um, the same note with just one. The upper keyboard can activate its own jack. Wow. And then we have the octave, or the forefoot they call it, which is activated by the bottom keyboard. So already, as you can see, the spatial layout puts one row of jacks much closer to, in this case, the nut, the bridge yes. is on that side. And that gives you the more nasal tone uh, that one would get by plucking the guitar string closer to the bridge. Right. Um, and that is uh, controlled by the upper keyboard. Mm. And the um, row of jacks farther away uh, is activated by the bottom keyboard, as well as the set of jacks that pluck the octave string. So it gives a rounder waveform, a slightly kind of boomier sound, but uh, while the upper keyboard jacks give the nasal sound. That is so cool. You know, it's an incredible thing when you, when you think about all the mechanisms that are going on just to produce sound in this thing are just incredible to me. Because in my mind, playing a string instrument is, there's just a string tied to two ends and you're moving the string. Mm. And you might be stopping that string in the left hand. And to have all these intricate things happening, and especially the, the, the double manuals and the three different jacks, is kind of blowing my mind. <laughs> well, Brandon, I think all of this is just a way for us to try to achieve what someone with a finger and a string <laughs> can do, right? It's just really uh, one of these um, beautiful things that, you know, through the magic of technology, we can get close to, but certainly we can never fully replicate the um, experience of a mm. plucked string instrument without its uh, middleman. Um, I mean, another one of the bells and whistles on the harpsichord that I think might uh, tickle you is this, um, what we call uh, a buff stop, uh, which creates sort of lute or harp-like color. Uh, there, now you're talking my language. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a sort of a row of leathers glued onto a baton here that we can move um, horizontally. Oh, yeah. uh, when you engage it in the on position, it touches one of the strings and essentially mutes it, but gives it a wonderful lute or harp-like quality. That's gorgeous. And this allows us, for example, then in some of the repertoire to contrast the left hand, the accompaniment part, to the melody in something like uh, this uh, passage from Bach. That's beautiful. You know, so, I, I, I've heard people do this, but I never knew how exactly it worked. Yeah, it's just, again, another technological gizmo. Mm. Um, and I think just these innovations, uh, certainly something like this would not be a standard, it's a little bit like a car. You know, you can have automatic windows or, you know, manually right. rolled windows. Um, and some instruments are much simpler. But as the harpsichord evolved, and I mentioned an instrument like this is sort of a, a representation of the apex of the harpsichord from mm. 
middle of the 18th century France, they were really interested in exploring as many colors as possible. So things like this arise, the many rows of jacks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, this continued well into, say, the classical period um, as a means for the harpsichord to stay relevant as the piano, which had been invented in the uh, middle half of the early 1700s, um, started to arrive on the scene. You know, the piano was essentially a harpsichord that could play forte and piano. Which is why it was called the piano forte. Exactly, <laughs> right. And, um, but the harpsichord coexisted with that for such a long, long time. So there is, um, I believe, uh, a saying that the, the term we use, bells and whistles, like mm. came from keyboard instruments Oh yeah, from the early classical period, because like you'd have pedals that activated bells, and like you know different stops. You'd have harpsichords. I think Haydn's harpsichord had a Venetian swell uh, attached to the outside. So, Jason, I expect more at our next concert. <laughs> <laughs> all these things to be happening. <laughs> it's like one of these like one man, you know, like oompa bands or something, yeah. right? Where you just have like the percussion and the Kazoo. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, all the bells and whistles. Oh, that's so cool. When you look inside a harpsichord, it's already just like the architecture of it. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that most harpsichords happen to have kind of like on a lute, the, the sound hole is filled in with a, a decoration of sorts. Uh, this one is sort of a metal, it looks like almost like a metal. It's gilded. Mm -hmm. It's gilded. Yeah, okay. it's gilded with the maker's mark. So, mm -hmm. different. Uh, harpsichord builders, even back in historical times, uh, would have sort of stamped their mark uh, mm. uh, in it uh, with their initials and, you know, either with an angel or, a, you know, the Lamb of God. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, so the French style harpsichords especially had the gilded rows. Um, some of them were actually much more elaborately painted throughout. The, the whole soundboard would be filled with um, flowers and birds and... I've seen a lot of... They, they often make this into a painting of its own Yes, as well. mm -hmm, yeah, the, the big flat surfaces are a perfect sort of tableau for yeah. uh, artwork. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier about depends on how ostentatious you want to make your instrument and what, uh, what kind of message you're trying to get across. Makers today should put like, call 773 for a lute of your own or harpsichord of your own. <laughs> It's the perfect marketing, yes, it's just, it's calling for it. Um, it might save the entire music industry. Uh, you know, as we're talking, I'm having flashbacks to gigs we've had where you've had to come with your harpsichord so super early. And it's made me, made me realize that maybe people don't realize when you show up to a gig, it's not often, you know, oh, there's a harpsichord ready to go. You have to bring your own, this whole thing, <laughs> to a gig sometimes. How, how does one transport a harpsichord? I think that is the question I get the most often <laughs> when people realize or they see me starting to pack this thing up after yeah. concerts. Um, so yeah, like lute players and guitarists, violinists, harpists, uh, harpsichordists uh, often have to travel with their own instruments. And there are advantages to that. I mean, the fact that you get to play on an instrument that's yours, that, that you're really familiar with. Right. Um, of course, every instrument has its own quirks. Um, but yeah, an instrument like this, uh, once closed up, it's essentially just a big harp-shaped box. It mm. sits on a table stand, so it's not connected to the legs. And once the top part is wrapped up, it can be turned um, on its side, 90 degrees, and transported that way. So with harpsichords, like lutes and early guitars, uh, you can also play in temperaments. Uh, yes. And temperaments, if you don't know, are basically, it's a system of tuning where you compromise certain notes uh, so you no longer ha have what are called enharmonic pitches. Uh, a G sharp and an A flat are no longer the same note. It means that you can play in certain keys more in tune, uh, but of course you have to sacrifice other keys. Um, and uh, it's something that really works on the on lutes because you can just move our gut uh, frets. Uh, but how does one tune in temperaments on a harpsichord? Well, the harpsichord, um, because we don't have movable frets and stuff, it's, it's one of the most restrictive settings in which um, 
we can deal with temperaments. And I think that's why there's so much written about and um, done about temperaments among early keyboardists. Uh, mm. Certainly a work that everyone knows, like Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, uh, we are pretty sure it was his exploration of um, not equal temperament, which is the system we use nowadays on piano, but um, a way of treating or setting a temperament that all the 24 uh, major and minor keys um, were usable and harmonious. Um, the idea of temperaments too, um, to just sort of expand on what you said, is that by compromising the tuning of different intervals across the keyboard, um, it allows you to create distinct tonal characteristics for each key. Yes. So uh, playing a piece in C major, it sounds, it tastes very different from mm. playing, say, a piece in F sharp major, just because of where those, um, those intervals lie. And on the keyboard, um, they would have set the temperament. Um, there's evidence that, you know, while a lot of the performers were also the composers, so right. if you have a temperament that favored a set number of keys, then you just played or improvised pieces in those keys that you knew sounded really good. Um, we have a l evidence of a lot of uh, keyboard instruments that had multiple, so more than um, 12 keys per octave. Mm. So they would have had split sharps. The, the accidentals would have had, as you said, a, a G sharp and an A flat, um, which you could tune purely. That blows um, my mind. I've, I've seen some of those and they look like a such a nightmare to play. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I guess it's the same as, you know, uh, the, the accommodations they made for the music. It's right. a little bit like the Theorbo. If you have a guitarist or, or someone coming to the Theorbo and they see, why are there 14 strings? <laughs> well, you know, it's to make things easier in some respects. But, true. you know, for us, we go, why are there... 24, 36 keys to the octave. Yeah. And I mean, those were not the stock and trade, you know, um, mm. instruments that uh, people used, but um, we know that they thought a lot about temperaments mm. and it have mattered a whole lot to them because, you know, the articians spilled a lot of ink over it and harpsichord builders and players certainly had access to instruments like that. Well. Wow. Jason, I'm so glad we finally got to have this lengthy conversation. I've been wondering about all these things for so long, and uh, I appreciate you coming here to explain all this, and I think uh, the audience will be appreciative as well. I mean, they generally get uh, information about the pluckies that, that I use, but to bring on experts like you to, to share the beauty of this instrument and its history is really special, so thank you. I'm really happy for this opportunity to share a little bit about what I know about the instrument. Certainly, it's just the tip of the iceberg, right? You know, there's so many different types of harpsichords and mm. each with their own stories. But uh, I think, yeah, it's an instrument that um, you know, we see so often and, and in Baroque concerts. And I hope uh, our chat demystified it a little bit for your listeners. And me too. <laughs> okay. Well. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Oh, hello. Craig Trumpeter from the Viola da Gamba video a couple weeks ago. I wanted to remind you about Haymarket's upcoming productions of Asus and Galatea on October 30th, Apollo and Daphne on March 5th, and Orlando next June. Hope to see you there.